Welcome environmental science students. I think we're rolling here and we're referring here now to the environmental science aqua aquatic biology uh, sheet that you were given. Uh, it is this one with it has some vocab terms on the front and now I'd like to address those short answer review questions on the back. So find the back of that and let's go through them now. Take a look at number one. It says compare the conversion of solar energy to autotrophs in a lentic and lotic ecosystem. Lentic systems allow more plant biomass to accumulate, and this is storage of solar energy. Lotic systems are moving, causing less plant buildup, and this, thus less energy storage. Looking at number two, a compare and contrast first order consumers in a lentic and lotic ecosystem. Well, first order consumers in lotic systems must be specialized to capture fast moving food. So we talk about the macroinvertebrates. We did the macroinvertebrate poster there, and these are usually not plankton like we found in the lentic systems, but they're the macroinvertebrates, stoneflies, caddisflies, and mayflies um, with specialized adaptations for capturing that fast-moving food. Lentic feeders usually need feeding mouthparts which can scrape and shred material. So we would start that food chain with zooplankton and this is where we find um, lentic feeders. Reading number three which says describe how functional feeding groups of aquatic insects are used in stream classification. And if you take a look at this diagram I showed in class, here you can see where <clears throat> the diagram here indicates a small stream, just a very small stream, and this is a first to a third order stream. And these are small streams, um, and <clears throat> some of the invert macroinvertebrates found here, um, many of them are collectors. Less than, just almost 50% are collectors. Uh, some grazers here, uh, and some predators, and then a large portion of them are shredders. So the shredders and the collectors are the main insect feeding, functional feeding groups that we find in small streams. Uh, also we have some willows here, uh, and these are, these are the plants we find in those types of streams. Looking down here to um, fourth to sixth order streams, uh, these are medium streams, and it shows uh, less trees maybe on the side. But the uh, collectors are still the main fun uh, functional feeding groups. Uh, and we have a large portion of grazers here now. Grazers just can take their time because uh, this water is starting to move slower. Still have some predators, but now a small portion of shredders. On the diagram, you may notice CPOM and FPOM. And I'd like you to write this in the border of your sheet there on the very top. Uh, CPOM in first order streams uh, means coarse particulate organic matter. So in first to third order streams we have uh, mostly coarse particulate organic matter. And these are larger pieces. As we start to move down to larger streams where it gets slower, we usually have fine particulate organic matter. So CPOM and FPOM are usually acronyms that describe the size of particles found in uh, smaller streams or larger streams. Getting back to the question in number three now, it says describe how functional feeding groups of aquatic insects are used in stream classification. Well, what I've written here is, as streams change from fast moving to slow moving, predators and shredders are replaced by grazers and collectors. All types are present throughout, only the percentages change. So this brings us to question number four. Identify and briefly describe five functional feeding groups found in a stream. So identify the names of them, and here are the names, uh, and to uh, describe them, you could just say uh, the percentages found at different types of orders of streams. So first to third, you would say collectors and shredders, mostly. 
uh, and in fourth to sixth order streams, collectors and grazers. So uh, we have just a different mix as water slows down and the volume increases. So far we've been talking about the biological components of streams. Biological meaning there are living things and from the living things in water we can tell um, something about that water. Uh, now we're going to talk in number five. It says identify and provide a realistic value for five abiotic factors that one would expect to find in a local stream. Uh, more of the chemistry behind uh, water analysis includes pH. Maybe a pH of seven what would be a reasonable expectation since seven is even. Also, and we've talked about this, uh, dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen is necessary in your bottles. It's also uh, necessary for animals that live in these aquatic systems to breathe. Alkalinity is one of the tests that uh, we will do in the class, so you'll learn more about that later. Uh, additionally, hardness. We'll do some hardness testing, and again, we'll learn about that later. I'll give you the notes on that. But one more thing here we talked about when we went to the creek was temperature. Temperature sure is going to vary dissolved oxygen contents, and it's also going to uh, make a difference in the animals that you find living there. Your homework on page 113, number one, asked you to compare and contrast uh, the five uh, nutrient cycles described in your book. Uh, number six on this sheet says, explain what is meant by the term eutrophic as it relates to a pond or stream ecosystem. And we said the term uh, eutrophic, which is found on the other side of this sheet, is a term for excessive amounts of nutrients. Nutrients be, uh, being nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and carbon. And these are four of the five nutrient cycles, water being the other one, or the hydrologic cycle. So that's the answer for number six. At this point, I'm, I trust you are able to list the components of a typical food chain for a stream or a lake or pond. I want you to skip down now to number eight and compare and contrast the abiotic factors of a first to a third order stream. And these abiotic factors are pretty simple. If you take a look, uh, first thing we have is water velocity. How does the water change from a first to a third order stream? Well, it just slows down. That's what velocity means. Also, water volume. The water volume increases. Tiny little mountain streams, as they flow down, they get bigger and bigger. Next is slope decreases from a first order stream to a third order stream. So the slope just levels out. First it's steep, and then it levels out. Next we have the particle size. Don't forget CPOM, coarse particulate organic matter, and FPOM fine particulate organic matter uh, and dissolved oxygen. In the first order streams we have high levels of dissolved oxygen because we have cold temperatures, we have mechanical aeration when water bubbles over rocks, uh, but we also there have low pressure, low atmospheric pressure high in the mountains and that doesn't help to keep dissolved oxygen dissolved in the water. Although third order stream has warm water, it's not really good for maintaining dissolved oxygen, and it has less aeration, but it has high pressure. So these are contrasting and similarities between the first and third order stream. Taking a look at uh, very, very large streams now, huge rivers really, uh, you can see there's a, a lot of collectors and a few predators, and that's it. Um, our uh, scrapers and shredders uh, don't really live in these large, large bodies of water, although you can see some diatoms down here uh, and some zooplankton. Uh, but this is how th things change once we get to a larger river. Uh, number, I will, uh, will teach you how to calculate the diversity index in our next class. But for now, skip down to number seven or number ten, and it says identify three possible sources of stress to a stream ecosystem. Stress factors include pH, dissolved metal ions, and temperature. Well, this is Mr. Holland signing off, saying uh, 
prepare some questions for me. It's always good to get good questions, and I'll see you in class.